For us, the initial victory was that people actually broke that barrier of fear and took to the streets no matter what the cost to demand their rights. That was the victory. It was seeing these masses who had been so scared in the past actually coming out and saying, no, I am no longer going to be afraid. I, yes, I might be afraid because I know what might happen to me, but I will tread on that fear and I'll take to the streets anyway. <laughs> It's a step that people must take to speak up, mm -hmm. to speak their mind. Everybody is criticizing the prime minister, but not in public. So we thought if we took that step, the people will start speaking about what they know. My father Many basically changed that culture. Things. He came out in a local seminar and called the prime minister out by name and said that he was responsible for this corruption and mess in the country. And that's when it changed. You suddenly had thousands of people out on the streets in Bahrain calling for the prime minister by name to step down. <laughs> He was actually arrested brutally in April 2011. And that's when, you know, a lot of us who were working for the Bahrain Center for Human Rights realized that there was nothing that was off limits anymore. We realized that there was nothing that was seen as a red line anymore. Bahrain, because of its geopolitical importance, as human rights defenders, it is so much more difficult for us to get a, an international response to the human rights violations in Bahrain. Well, since uh, the beginning of the year, my house been attacked several times by the security institution, security apparatus, where Frontline came out with the idea of uh, fixing a camera, monitoring camera in my house. And the security uh, uh, institution are not aware that I have those cameras. In the video, I came to know that was it and here right now. In the video, you will see a, a tear gas coming while people are standing here. The boy just moved and it was behind him here. Ooh, like that, and it hit this part. And still, I would consider myself the most protected guy because of my international affiliation, because working with many human rights groups. So you could imagine a normal people, how they're facing, uh, how they've been treated here. We're seeing that the Bahraini government is now becoming a lot more comfortable in going after human rights defenders. So even people like Nabil Rajab and Zainab al-Khawaja, who last year, at the very worst time of the crackdown, were seen as people they would not put in prison, now they are comfortable in arresting them and putting them in prison. And I would expect they are outside my house now, monitoring and seeing if I go out or not. And I think it's because of the tweets I made past few days, criticizing the king and the prime minister. I will not go. I will not go. I will stay here till they come. This complication that we have to face, that our government, those dictators in this part of the world, are influential because of the money, because of the wealth, because of the interest of the Western government, especially the United States, because of the arms sale. We have to pay higher price than what normally people pay for freedom and democracy. I'm not
نفسي لا أريد بقاها لترقى خميسا في العراي على الرمى فإن عشت لم أولم وإن مت لم أذم كفى بك ذلا أن تعيش وترغم حفظ الله البحرين وأهلا من كل مكروه والسلام عليكم Abdul Hadi Al Khwaja, who was severely tortured, because you know, subjected to a trial, went on 110 days of hunger strike. No response from the international community, or very little response. There was not enough pressure to get him out, and so he continues to be in prison today. Nabil Rajab was arrested on the 5th of May 2012, and he was put in prison for three weeks. No response internationally from governments. And then he was re-arrested in the beginning of June this month, and he continues to be in prison today. <laughs>